I would like to introduce the panel for today. Uh, to my left is Devin Radford from Fox. And you can introduce a little bit about yourself as well. Good afternoon, Tel Aviv. <laughs> All right. See you in the back. Uh, I handle licensing. Well, actually, my role is changing slightly, but <clears throat> I've been at Fox for four years. Um, we do mostly licensed games, uh, such hits as Family Guy, The Quest for Stuff, with our friends at, at uh, SGN, formerly SGN, now Jam City, Jam City. Uh, and other great products. And I'm happy to be in Tel Aviv. It's one of my favorite cities to visit. And in the middle, we have Chala Eager from Good Game Studios. I'm Chala, <clears throat> um, um, the BD guy from Good Game Studios. I'm with Good Game since almost a half decade now. We are developing and publishing our own games. We started with the web, and now we are also in mobile as well. Not now, we are in the mobile business since three and a half, four years now as well. Thanks. Finally, Rob Zakari from Jam City. I got it. Zakari, and I'm the uh, head of corporate development, and I'm also general counsel. And uh, when I started at Jam City, it was called SGN, and we changed our name. And uh, we just recently acquired TinyCo. And so uh, I'm very excited to be here for my first time visiting Israel in a great city and looking forward to a lively discussion. Great. So today, what we're speaking about is IP, licensed IP versus original IP, and how that affects um, user engagement. Uh, we'll keep it pretty general and definitely cover a lot of thoughts on it, hopefully get a lively discussion, nothing too chaotic, but uh, if there's questions at the end, we'll take them at the end. So, um, And I'll just kind of open it up to whoever wants to field it, and then uh, other opinions can jump in after that. So I guess starting from the licensor, what is your what is your process your your identification process you know how do you decide uh who you're going to work with as far as development of your of your licensed ip well yeah that uh, i think i have the best job in the games industry because <clears throat> we've got a lot of great ip that um, is well suited for games um, i get to travel around and meet with talented studios um, i would say that you know we're always looking at different categories different genres uh, companies who've had success in those in those genres, but really the the most important thing to us is teams that have passion for for the brands. Uh, the best example I always use is is TinyCo. Um, we were doing a big process for for Family Guy. Um, the Simpsons was doing extremely well; it was number one around the world. And we were looking to our next sort of big animated brand to uh, to make a game. We had a, a process that involved some of the largest publishers in video games and and TinyCo. Uh, there was kind of it was kind of a four horse race by the end. And they, they won the, the deal um, almost solely based on their, their will and passion um, for the IP. They knew the brand inside and out. And if you played the game, you know that it's very true to the brand. And, um, it has been successful mostly because of that. So passion is, uh, is a huge part of, uh, of our process. OK. So speaking of that game and some others, uh, is there a joint kind of collaboration with the developer and the licensor about the genre of that game, or is the genre really the expertise of the developer? Well, in the case of TinyCo, staying with that particular example, um, different from Jam City prior to the acquisition, Jam City uh, was uh, pretty much focused on casual uh, puzzle games. And an area that we were not very good at is the builder genre. Um, when we looked uh, at the market and looked at companies that were experts in a particular genre, TinyCo stood out as having a very good builder engine and perfectly set up to wrap a good IP over it and present a good experience to the user. So as far as the genre is concerned, I think that when the licensor is looking at the company to work with, they do look uh, not only at how passionate and knowledgeable they are about the IP, but also whether their expertise in a particular game structure is going to do well for the IP. Um, so you you may not it may not work for a mid-core 
uh, game, um, a particular IP, no matter how good that company is. So I do think it is collaborative, but I think the licensor ultimately needs to start off understanding what they want to do, um, you know, who they want to work with, and, and what their long-term goals are. Okay. Now, Chala, not working with licensed IPs, uh, what is your um, process of identification of what game you're going to create? A, a lot of market research, or you know, kind of how do you go through that process with not uh, using your own original IP? <clears throat> I mean, this is exactly um, the opposite. You guys, what you guys are doing from what we are doing is we are not really uh, looking for IPs. I mean, it's all, it's, of course, it's a, it's a big subject at the moment because user acquisition costs are super high, and if it's a big brand, it's a big IP, you can do really easily user acquisition, and you can reduce your user acquisition costs. But this is nothing where we are looking to when we want to create a game. The most important thing is that the game uh, should be a great game. So um, you can have the best IP in the world. When the game is not good enough, it will not perform. And if you, even if you reduce your user acquisition costs, at the end, you want to make a uh, game what is um, competitive in the market, especially um, yeah, in, the, in the more competitive genres, such as strategy games. This is what we are um, good in. And um, actually, we tried a lot of different things. Uh, we tried a puzzle, a match three game, we tried some um, other innovative stuff uh, like a clicker, etc. But at the end, we recognized we are good in building strategy games. So that's why we are focused on strategy games, to, due to the fact that we are good in it. And this is how we identify what kind of games we want to build. So doing what you can do, not I mean, don't try things you are not having expertise in. So um, yeah. Okay. So Jam City has seen success on, on both sides of the coin. Um, what is the decision-making process as to knowing what your game is going to be, even in the SGN games of casual games, having something branded like Book of Life versus <gasps> Panda Pop? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's interesting how uh, just re we were just positioned as the company that does IP when Actually, we, we rarely did IP. Um, I think the first one that we did uh, was um, was Book of Life, and it was a great success. It took three years to convince you guys to do it, by the way. And once we did it, we knocked it out of the park. Um, to some extent, the game is um, as, if not more successful than the film itself, just uh, for the companies. But it's been really, really fun um, to work on that. Uh, the longevity of that game is also um, a testament to how good the IP was when we did the game. Uh, to this day, we still update it, we still put new levels on it, and we have really good engagement. But really, the games, the games that put uh, Jam City on the map were our original IP, which is Cookie Jam and Panda Pop. And those are juggernauts that are still continuing. And for us, they're very important. Um, we just, for the first time, tried uh, to integrate some outside IP in special events for a short period of time. Um, in uh, We just did it with Cookie Jam and Panda Pop. And we're just starting to do some analysis to, see, to, analysis to see, did that additional IP that we bring in give a lift to the game, to um, revenue um, that it wouldn't have had if, if we just had put in our own um, new features for the month. So we're actually starting to test to see how we can integrate original IP uh, with, with uh, existing IP that we license. So the decision, to go back to your question of how we come up with the idea, whether we decide to go with IP or not, is we do want to build the best game first, and then we decide can it work with IP or not. So, and that's a long process. Okay. So is it safe to say that if if you can get licensed IP for that game engine, that that's the better routes? And, and for what reasons that might be? Uh, you know, just the notoriety and and the maybe ease of installs? Again, there's, there's other risks involved with licensing IP. Um, the barrier to entry to create your own game is lower because in order to get licensed IP one you have to get the meeting two you have to compete with the other companies 
And three, eventually, you're going to have to come up with some money. <laughs> and so sometimes that's, you know, that's difficult, and there is a risk you're taking. Um, that investment of resources into the IP license, you could also invest internally um, and create your own game, uh, probably for a lower uh, uh, investment. However, you don't have the security of having a partner uh, who has a well-recognized IP to help you uh, launch the game. So there are risks and rewards on both. I wouldn't say one is necessarily better than the other. Okay. Yeah. We're straddling the line. We're doing both. <laughs> That's fair. So, okay. So we're, we're deciding to launch a game. Uh, Pre-launch, how do you maybe quantify engagement? Chala? Engagement? Um, of course, I mean, it uh, life ops. That's the most important part of engaging users and keeping the users in the game. So that's why, I mean, you can have an IP to engage the users as well. But the thing is, like, as example, you have a show like Game of Thrones. Then the movie and the, and the show is someday over. Will they also stop playing your game? Are they not engaged anymore? How do you want to keep them playing your game? I mean, the show is over. You watched all the episodes, all the seasons, and then, you know, it is also... A, Another thing, so life ops is very important for games. It's not the IP itself, my opinion. Yeah, not at all. I mean, this is the, the funny example is with Book of Life. Uh, you know, the movie didn't do very well in the box office. It's a great film. The art is beautiful. What ended up happening? I mean, it's done extremely well um, for us and for for Jam City over there. Um, but the, we're done with content. I mean, it's SGN Jam City is. <laughs> is creating uh, all new content now. It's completely, we, we've tapped all of the assets that we had, all the artwork, all, <laughs> all of the, uh, all the stuff is gone. And so uh, I, I could say that Jam City is, is sort of the, the brand owner now of, of Book of Life. We even changed the name, we took Book of Life off the front because it was gonna do better in, uh, in SEO. Um, we were optimizing for the store. So now it's Sugar Smash, Book of Life. I'm, you know, and that's, that's something that's really interesting is that uh, the world that was created by Guillermo del Toro is, is beautiful, it's interesting, it fits well with the puzzle genre, but by no means is, is the brand bringing users into the game anymore. I mean, it's, uh, if we were doing a sequel, yeah, I could see that happening, but you know, it's, uh, it's a testament to the world that was created and, and the job that, that uh, Jam City has done building a game. So with that game specifically, what were the most important KPIs uh, in, the, in the test time period? to say we're, we're definitely going to take this to launch? So I have to admit that I didn't start at Jam City till this oh. year, <laughs> so, uh, and in May, but I think yeah, I, I, ha I mean, he, he can probably answer more accurately. Well, these guys, I mean, Jam City is a well-oiled machine. Um, you know, if, <laughs> you know, they, they looked at, at the KPIs. I mean, looking at retention, looking at, at ARPDAO, um, they knew basically we were, we actually were coming in a little higher than, than uh, Cookie Jam. Uh, was you know in its in its pre-launch phase, but I think you say um, that that's them having improved their engine over time. Um, but like they knew right away it was going to be a success, and they were like, okay, we're ready to we're ready to go. But I mean, now after years, you guys are creating content, and it goes without the IP itself, and you're sharing all your revenues. How's that? How does that feel? Well, not to comment on the deal, um, but th it works very well for both parties. Okay. I mean, no, specif so well. specifically, so we don't share. So there's there's obviously a, an ongoing relationship between the parties, um, and for us, the when he's saying we're creating content, you know, th those are the continued levels that we're creating, and we have the infrastructure and the the you know the artists upstairs. When I say upstairs, they literally sit upstairs from my from my <laughs> office, you know, working hard at, at creating new levels. But it's a the deal is one that both parties, you know, we just look at it. If it continues to be successful, it's successful, and we continue it. And if there comes a time when it's no longer something that we want to pursue or we we don't want to put our resources to it, the two of us will come together and 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 make a decision that way. But we we change our deals all the time. I mean, it's yeah. I think I shouldn't say that actually. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell my boss I said that. Um, no, but I mean, it's like, it's a partnership. It's like we're, you know, if it's not working, it's, if it's not working for one party, it's not working for both. So, you know, in a lot of cases, we'll, we'll take a look at it and say, you know, what, what's working, what's not, and how can we, how can we make this, you know, more appropriate. Okay, so, I mean, because there are also 
different IP holders with different attitude. And so because as example, when, when I hear IP, then, you know, like you're seeing Marvel is giving almost everyone their IP. So, I mean, you, as example, Not you to name any names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> By the way, we have that, we have that IP also. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, this is the thing. You do music physician, you do TV campaigns, whatever, and you don't know where you are sending the users. And then you see uplift on Net Marbles Marvel instead of Kabam's Marvel. So these kind of things are, you know, the reason why we also think like, shall we do it or not? And then ending up with not doing it because of these um, examples. So whichever route you choose to take. Uh, how do you know if something is just dead in the water? And at what point, you know, do you do you ride that out, or have you seen something that was trending to be one way and came out hugely successful? Well, I have an anecdote, and I can't get into details, but uh, a company had fought very hard for one of the probably best IPs or IPs group of grouping of IPs that we all recognize. Um, they paid a lot of money for it. They started developing the game. Um, halfway through development, they realized that the licensor was not letting the game maker produce the game that they wanted to make. And they literally paid the breakup fee on the contract. It was several million dollars and walked away from the game rather than make the game because of two reasons. One. They couldn't afford the long-term commitment to the game. And secondly, they just didn't want to put out a game that was subpar. But I think there is a big um, stumbling block if you just look at the IP and not pay attention on how to get there. Don't get the IP at whatever cost. And I think that's, that's what, that was the mistake they did. They didn't do their due diligence on the partner to figure out what kind of game they wanted to build. They just said, we don't care, let's get the deal, we'll figure out the game later. And I think that's a cautionary tale. So I have definitely seen that happen. As the licensor, are, are you putting certain measurements in at the, the beginning stages to make sure, you know, are there ever opportunities to see false positives where you had to change it around or had to halt the project? I, I mean, no. I, I, for us, it's like if our partner has, has invested, you know, eight months, 12 months, 14, 18 months in, in developing the game and, and made that investment, I mean, we're not going to tell them to kill it. Uh, sometimes it's, sometimes I wish we would have. I have got a few examples, but like, you know, if they've invested millions of dollars in, in creating something and it doesn't look like it's going to work out well, um, in a lot of cases, they, you know, they need to launch it and, and try and generate some revenue. and. To be honest, I mean, as a as a licensor, I probably should kill those. Um, but you know, we're not trying to put people out of business. Chala, for you, uh, are there hallmarks that would be indicators for long-term engagement, and and what are you looking for to know what your game is potentially going to be successful? I mean, we <clears throat> we usually um, develop a minimum value product with a core loop, and now we go on soft launch. Um, and then we analyze the KPIs, especially retention is very important. And when we have the feeling that the game is the core loop of the game is not doing that well, then we give them a few another a few other tries. And then if we see it's not going to work out, then we kill it. So this is how we do it. And the good thing is, like since we are independent, we don't need to ask anyone: Is it okay for you? Can we do it? Shall we do it or not? You like the KPIs? What do you think about the KPIs, etc.? We just kill it, and then we go to the next project. Think this year we killed at least four, five, six games. So this is something what is happening constantly. Okay. So you had mentioned uh, retention and, um, you know, you've now decided to have a game, whether it is an IP licensed game or if it's an original IP game. Uh, do you feel that the licensing is enough to kind of start that market for, for organic research or organic downloads? Do you think that the, the brand speaks for itself, per se? It's the game. The brand is, I mean, maybe the, the brand might be a door opener, but it's the game itself. If you don't, you can have the best brand in the world. If the game is not good enough, it will not perform. So, and, and the other way around, same. So, um, the, you definitely, um, 
you know, need to um, have good retention, as I said, and then it doesn't matter. And of course, on the long run, um, after you see the game is ramping up, then you can start investing in testimonials, CV campaigns, etc. You can build up your own brand. As I just said, as example, Netmarble, as example, they are always and only investing in their brand. You will see Net Netmarble on every icon, very fat written letters. So because they invest in their brand. So um, I think branding is gonna be a more uh, bigger topic uh, in the fu future, but at the moment it's all is performance based. Okay. Do you feel that you market differently, Rob, or Jam City markets differently uh, because of the IP and you know things like uh, show movie releases? Like I, I know with our game, The Walking Dead, the season premiere just came out, and so obviously there were spikes there to kind of build the anticipation for that. Um, how does that affect your marketing with the brands? So um, we only acquired the uh, the two more active uh, brands that we license. Uh, so Tinyco, it, one is Marvel, we have the Marvel Academy. And then we also have um, Family Guy. Um, as far as the difference in, in marketing, we generally, we generally tend to stay away from, um, or we don't necessarily look at IP for movies or television shows because we don't feel comfortable in exactly the timing of when a, a film may premiere and comes out or a television show and popularity and the fact that there may be ebbs and flows. The way we do RUA, it's a very well-oiled machine and it's very data-driven and we, we need to do what we need to do within our expertise and we can't be tied to you know the ups and downs of either a star's popularity or a movie's popularity or a television show's popularity. Um, this, this, so, but when you talk about a, an IP like Family Guy that has so much history now, um, it's no longer tied to you know, the new episode or a special or something right. like that. So within uh, what we do to kind of create some of that interest or spike is within Family Guy, we do a lot of we bring a lot of outside IP into the world. And that's because the show itself does a lot of callbacks to uh, pop culture within the show. So we have had in the past, um, Snoop Dogg has appeared as a cartoon within, and you can get anyone you want that's interesting to show up within the game as an event, and that can create interest. But we can't tie it uh, necessarily to an event like a movie release or a new season of right. a very popular show like Walking Dead. Okay. So Chala, without having those types of resources to maybe utilize, do you do marketing differently? Do you do live operations differently? I mean, as, as you said, we also are very uh, data driven. So performance marketing is for us the key. So that's why we don't um, rely on any of these. Um, I mean, of course, if there's a an, there's an, uh, Christmas coming, of course, we do have a Christmas theme. So and then we will have, we will do live ops like that. So this is something what we definitely do. But, um, but actually, this is it. It's way more simple than like the next episode is coming or the next season is coming out or something like that. We don't, we don't uh, focus on these kind of things. It's just like making, constantly updates to engage the users to keep them staying in the game as example empire for kingdoms is now over three and a half years old and our users stick to the game because we do still have over 60 people focusing on that game adding constantly um con uh, content to the game every month we do have a big content update so other companies are maybe doing this every three or four months we do it monthly mm -hmm. so this is for us the key um to keep the users engaged and keep them playing the game. Are you guys buying TV? Tele broadcast media? Um, no. At all? Have you tested it? Not, not yet. <laughs> not yet, but I'm sure you will. Uh, that, I'm just asking. What's happening? <laughs> to follow up on that, uh, you know, with your original IP, how do you know when you reach like critical mass? What is that indicator for you that you've reached critical mass? Oh, good question. Um, after, I mean, I would say after seeing that the people are happy with the content and we do surveys in the game and to understand them, 
And if you will get bad reviews, of course, then it's an indicator that you're doing something wrong. So this is the way actually how we do it. I mean, yeah. Does that sound similar with your original IP? Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. We, we, every week, we have a fairly large meeting, fairly large uh, uh, KPI meeting, and we're very closely monitoring um, retention, um, the revenues, um, reviews as well. Um, a lot of we, we're paying a lot of attention to um, to make sure that the experience that the users um, are having is is stays up to par. But every now and then, you know, it's where we find problems with tech, something that happens that we see spikes or dips, uh, either in complaints or revenue. But we're we're looking at it literally on a weekly basis. Um, I mean, we look at it every day, but the management is actually up to f the founders sit there in the KPI meeting every week looking at every game's numbers. Okay. So now we're going to fast forward a little bit more. We've after launch, it's a year later, um, and you know, re-engagement, uh, the original IP versus a licensed IP. Uh, if it's licensed IP, do you work with a licensor to kind of assist in, in re-engagement opportunities, or is this now solely on the developer? It really depends on the partner, but we found that um, whenever we have an idea, we are able to comfortably reach out to the licensor and talk about things that we may want to do. As it doesn't, it doesn't mean we change the agreement. It just sometimes means we add to it. You know, we may say, hey, we want to try something out, and if it makes sense, then, you know, it's got to be help, uh, helpful for both sides. But we don't necessarily, you know, the re-engagement, it's, we don't, I know we're a year in, hypothetically, right now, but we generally try, we're looking at it all the time. Uh, so it's something that happens in real time. Uh, you know, we do get to a point in our agreements where, you know, we're starting to come up towards the end of it, we want to make sure, you know, that's when you kind of have to decide what you're going to be doing with the IP. Do you want it to keep going or not? And so you, the constant communication between licensor and licensee is the most important way. And we do have more of a relationship than just sign the contract, send the checks, and be done with it. Right. You ha really do have to have a constant communication. Do you feel that with that license IP, sometimes that you can't maybe make decisions as quickly as, say, original IP to get those, like, ebbs and flows moving faster. You absolutely cannot move as fast. That's well, just, well, well. <laughs> you just can't. Depends but, on who your partner is, no. doesn't it? <laughs> he, he, the, the mere fact that we, if I have to send an email out outside of our domain and get an approval to come back, that's, that's a little bit slower than someone like you who, who can pretty much make a decision. But uh, it's not just the licensor. Uh, sometimes it's just even our internal ops, you know, to make fast changes or things like that. You know, we we're bit we're maybe we are at a size now that we can't maybe move as fast as someone smaller. But having a licensor in the mix, yes, you're, you're just not going to be able to do anything as quickly as someone who doesn't. Obviously, that makes sense for us. And I'm going to plug The Walking Dead again. Uh, you know, knowing that the season premiere was coming out, I think that there might have been opportunities to maybe introduce a more high monetizing feature, but then you actually have to wait and time that out for that season premiere, per se. And not that there's a dip in the users, uh, but there, there could definitely be a spike um, like that. So with original IP, and you mentioned Christmas and seasonality, what other you know, kind of indicators for adding more or less content come through? I mean, it's also like after a while, you also start uh, focusing on the on the geo. As example, when in the Middle East there was Ramadan, then we had a Ramadan update. We had a Ramadan event within the game. This is something what we can also easily do, especially after after a while in, in being in the market. You want to adapt also the the cultural stuff within the game, and uh, it's not um, it's not a, it's nothing what we do in the beginning. Of course not, because first we want to see if the game is performing well in that region. Right. And if we see it goes to the right direction, then we also invest and do content updates for the region, as example, yeah. OK. So how do you know when it's time to keep supporting a game or if it's time to release another new game with, with that IP or that specific theme or genre? Actually, we're doing it constantly, so that's why 
you, you always need to um, develop new stuff. So using the same IP, it's something what we um, considered in the past, but we didn't execute because um, yeah, the game was doing so good that there was uh, no need. And of course, you also need to be a little bit careful when you do something like that to not cannibalize your own user base. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think you see, like, in our games in particular, when you're, when you're using brands that people love, um, particularly in, in, in games that are content heavy, like our Simpsons and Family Guy games, and Ice Age games. Um, there's users that have been there for one, two, three, four years. Um, they've invested hundreds, thousands of dollars. They play the game every day still. Uh, you know, I think when you've got something like 10,000 like super valuable players in, in a game, uh, yeah, okay, maybe the, it's decayed a little bit, but you know, those payers are looking for more content and they're looking for it like weekly. So, you know, at some point it makes sense to operate the game uh, you know, for extended period of time. I mean, we'd, we'd operate it forever, right? Because, you know, we're not, <laughs> it doesn't take our resources. Um, but yeah, we're, this is something we're constantly thinking about is what's the next game and how do we continue to, to give the, the users what they want uh, over the long period of time. But our Simpsons game, like, I don't think it's ever going to die. That thing is like, people are obsessed with it and it's been around for four years, which is like, you know, forever in mobile games. That makes sense. And you know, if you're not using licensed IP, if you're going to do the original IP games, like when do you decide, you know, how many strategy games are, are too much or how many match threes are, are too much that they're actually like um, congesting up the market? It's never too much. Okay. <laughs> so, so that's why, I mean, that's why we are uh, constantly producing games and that's why they are coming every week, uh, new games, cause it's never enough and everyone wants to have the next hit and there are always users you are not reaching out because, I don't know, maybe Empire Four Kingdoms is a bit too cartoonish for some players. So that's why you have to find another way uh, doing strategy games with different um, settings. When we look at Game of War, Mobile Strike, it's both strategy games but a different um, setting and they all reach out to other um, kind of uh, other players. So that's why yeah, it's never enough. And even for match three, I mean, we all know how many match three games are out there, and they are still constantly producing new match three games. So saying that someday there will be enough would not, um, yeah, it's not going to happen. So you had mentioned, uh, you know, there's another Marvel game or Marvels out there everywhere, or, uh, other brands. What is the effect if, if say, another Family Guy comes out? What is that effect, and how are how are those choices made as to continue with adding more content or maybe releasing another game? Well, we again, you work closely with your licensor. So I'm going to use we'll we'll stick with the Marvel um, example. Um, I think that. Going into the game, the licensor and the licensee understand that when they get that license, it's going to be within the confines of a particular genre. I think that's actually quite challenging for the licensor. Um, what they're trying to do is take the same IP and maximize its value and saying, OK, I'm going to take this IP. I'm going to give it to mid-core, casual, strategy, blah, blah, blah. Well. There is no one that can draft a contract that's going to prevent bleeding over of the effects of one game to okay. the other game. It's just not possible. Mm -hmm. And so that is quite a challenge for them. I think for the game, it's, you know, for the licensee, um, it's challenging of when you want to expand your user base and all of a sudden you're hit up against artificial walls um, that may be written in a contract that say you can't have this in it. Um, but you know, as someone who's looked at contracts for the last 20 years, is I know there's no one you can't draft it. And so, um, when you're gonna get IP, when you're gonna license IP, be as as a game developer, you should be um, cognizant of the fact that there could be games that are similar to yours that have the same IP name in it. Um, it's what comes after, you know, how, and how it's marketed. Right. That's that's important. So there is a challenge there. 
I wonder if you're referring specifically to any contracts you've read recently. No, no um, contracts I've read recently. <laughs> so, I, you know, as as the licensor, we've, you know, I, I've got quite a few contracts that have very complicated genre exclusivity sections. It's, first of all, we're, we are sort of giving up on that. Um, I think the only thing that we're looking at is, is windowing. Um, you know, I know it's hard to trust <laughs> another company. Um, it's hard to trust licensors. It's hard to trust a big media company. Um, but in a lot of cases, I think if you see our games, you know, we're not over licensing. We're not releasing games on top of each other and we're not releasing games in the same genre, mostly. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking constantly, we're working with uh, the broadcast network and the television studio, uh, the team at Fuzzy Door. We're, we're thinking about the Family Guy brand how we can extend it from the TV show and, and create something meaningful on mobile. The engagement we've seen from, from Family Guy, I mean, millions and millions of players have, have played it and are, are you know, enjoying the brand, and we think that that's very valuable. So you know, we're not trying to you know, grab some cash by putting a game out. We're, we're trying to uh, build meaningful, meaningful products that the audience will love. So you know, we, we're trying to manage it as well. So having genre exclusivity and, and things like that, it's it's not always the best approach, but a necessity sometimes. So is it an aligning of the stars that you're going to pick to move forward with that genre? That, like, There's a lot of Walking Dead titles, uh, games, different experiences coming out now. Uh, if this were today, I don't think that we would be making that game today. Um, how do you know, you know, what are you looking for to be in it at the time that we were in it? which is the advantageous time instead of people that are trying to do that title now? Um, I, I think part of that is, again, the type of IP. So a television show such as Walking Dead um, or even a, a movie, per se, it, it is more challenging. You don't know if you're, if you're getting in at the right time or you're coming in at the peak. Um, it, you know, but when you look at maybe more evergreen um, IP like Marvel, um, or DC or anything like that, you, you, you're able to make a more educated bet and mitigate your risk by coming in and, and just saying, look, there's always going to be a fan. I think now Family Guy and, and, and Simpsons is, is part of that too, is there's always going to be a subset of fans, of rabid fans of this IP. Um, but when, you know, at the beginning of a show like Walking Dead, there's no one that would have predicted, you know, that right. at the beginning. So. You may not come in now, but you don't regret having gotten in when you did. No. And that's 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 the that's the art and science of, of licensing IP. So it's a secret sauce. Very secret. <laughs> um, okay, so you know, with like launch timings, um, not having any licensing, you know, to follow. Obviously, you could do launch timings, you know, that makes sense for your development processes for for your teams. Uh, what is the challenge of having a launch timing that, that needs to be with a certain show release or movie release? Uh, you know, I know some companies that are down the street from, from where we are that have been doing that a lot with um, their, their kids' shows coming out. So what's, where, how do you face that challenge and, and get things there on time? Or well, I think you it? guys are the perfect example of that, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know. We don't do stuff with TV shows like that, but how do you guys do it? <laughs> yeah. It is challenging, Asking right? yourself. <laughs> um, if that were the case, you know, do you think it makes more sense to delay, or does it make more sense to be kind of beholden to... It, it always makes more sense to delay. You should never put a product up before it's ready, no question. And back to what Chala said about the game being high quality. And some of the one thing that I always think about is, like, if, if the game isn't good and it's got a brand on it, it's not going to do anything. And the reason is, can you imagine if you took the f characters from Family Guy and you made like a completely ridiculous episode that wasn't funny, like, and it was a bad episode? No one would, would like it. <laughs> they would watch it and go, this sucks. So if you make a game with Family Guy characters and it sucks, it sucks. It's, you know, don't put a game out that's not ready. So basically, no, no IP is going to save the game. Well, you know, if you can't keep the users in the game and you release it, then, then what's the point? And yeah, okay, if you release a Family Guy game and it's a piece of crap, you know, it's going to still get millions of downloads, you know, but if the, if the game sucks, they're not going to stay in it. 
Are any of you doing like really unique marketing plans, kind of doing some offline, um, using other sources, even though there could be like these, these brands that uh, would help those marketing efforts? Anything that's cutting edge? I mean, I, I would say we are one of the first companies who ever did user acquisition, performance-based user acquisition through uh, TV campaigns. And I think we started in 2013, 12. They said no. <laughs> Sorry? They said no when I asked you if you were buying TV. Okay, then, then okay. I, I thought you were, okay, there was a misunderstanding then. No, 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 we, of course we did TV campaigns for our games. But, um, but the thing is, after a while, uh, in the beginning, you, you see every, every single um, music position ways you're doing um, isolated, you know? But um, after a while, be, being with the brand on the market, you start um, seeing everything collected together. Like, if you do um, TV campaigns, it affects your conversion on display advertisement as well. So, and this is something uh, what what is very important after being a while in the in the market. But in the beginning, everything is performance marketing. If the game is not um, scalable through marketing, then you don't need to invest in this game anymore. So, and this is also one of the green lightning processes uh, at our company. So, of course, minimum value product, then we do marketing if we like the KPIs, and then we see, is this game um, scalable through marketing? If not, then we don't invest in the games anymore. Okay. We, we, I, I'd like to also answer that question. Okay. Um, another plug for, for, actually, I haven't plugged this game yet, but in our, in our animation throwdown game, um, we're working with Congregate, which is owned by GameStop, uh, and they did a pretty impressive program of, of in-store uh, marketing for the game, which, by the way, it's the first... I mean, if you've been to a GameStop in November, you see it's Call of Duty all, like everywhere. So we plastered the store in October with Animation Throwdown. So it's the first mobile game advertised in, a, in, in the same fashion that a console, a big console release would be uh, advertised. We don't have the numbers yet on, on how it did. I mean, I, mean I, can see, I can tell you the game has gotten a ton of downloads, um, and, it's, and it's doing well, but you know, I don't know... If we had if we had spent five million dollars on this campaign and and put you know our media into sixty three hundred stores, I don't know what the I don't know what the return is today. We, um, it also depends like in which region you are. As example, in in Brazil or in Turkey, people are playing still. Um, this is not mobile games; it's more uh, web games. But people are playing games in the internet cafes. So if you go to the internet cafes in Brazil or in Turkey, you will see everywhere posters, and they're really using this offline um, yeah, way to make user acquisition, and it really helps. I so. like how it's innovative for us to be going into traditional media. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we touched a lot on the, the marketing UA, but as far as retention, um, you know, what do you think about social influencers? I know that we had social influence with the Walking Dead release, but uh, how much more of that is going to be used? Do you like social influencers? <laughs> Actually, it's very, very important, and um, but you definitely need the product to do social influencer marketing. As example, our game is a strategy game. It's a more click and wait. So how do you want to do uh, you, um, influencer marketing for that kind of game? It really depends on the game, but it definitely makes sense. If you have, especially if it's a game where you can, where, uh, where you have a lot of animations in it and there's action in the game, it definitely makes sense. And it really helps to scale. Yeah, it's a hugely important channel. I mean, if you look at YouTube and you look at where you know, some of the most valuable gamers are, they're watching influencers play games, talk about games. I mean, it's, it's essential now in the mix. So are there differences that any of you are seeing in, uh, with the genres as far as engagement? Are there any genres that have some kind of secret sauce to their engagement numbers? And what are those reasons? You got the two opposite ends of the spectrum right here. <laughs> I, I don't know. If, it, if, if there's secret sauce, no one's sharing it with us. Uh, that's, that's what I found walking Nor will around. Nor anybody share it yeah. here. <laughs> walking around this week, I haven't, no one's shared it with me. But um, I'll, I'll say that we're definitely in um, this week, Jam City, we've been meeting with a lot of companies, just chatting with them, large, small, and um, you know, looking at different genres. And we're definitely seeing um, the engagement numbers of the mid-core um, games and up. 
and some of the uh, social casinos, you know, definitely differ from from ours. Uh, but we also have huge, um, you know, daily active users and monthly active users. So there's definitely a trade-off. And, and I'm speaking of our uh, Jam City core games, the casual games, versus um, our our builder games uh, in Marvel and, and Family Guy. So I think that to you almost have to when you analyze, uh, you have to go to each genre compare it to itself and try to improve itself and not have your eye on on another genre's performance numbers and hope to get there because the economic the, the, the economies don't always match up. And I think that's, you know, that's probably very obvious, but it's become more uh, apparent this week in just talking to companies doing a variety of different games. I think what we try to do, or what we hope to do, is is uh, with our brands just sort of beat um, the benchmarks for each category. So looking at strategy games, which have much smaller audience but higher value users. I mean, we'd like to just come in somewhere above what where we sort of see industry benchmarks. With casual games, I mean, you know, that's to be honest. I mean, that's that's our real strength because we're bringing in uh, hordes of users that uh, want to interact with the brands. But you know, I think hopefully we're you know, adding some value with um, our marketing and our and the IP. So Henry Lowenfels, our VP of Business Development, Ooh. was supposed to be here moderating this panel, and and his title for it was putting a ring on it. Um, so hopefully we've gotten to cover for all of you whether or not you should use branded, licensed IP, or just use your own original IP. And and Christina, this was a last minute thing, and, and she's like the lead HR person at Scopely, which by the way, you did a great job. Thanks. Um, so she deserves a big round of applause for being on the spot here. Yeah, hello. Uh, what about um, inter uh, AP? You know the show Rick and Morty? Yes. Adult Swim, yeah. And. Um, I go to Google Store, I see some one game about it, only one. So what you can do this uh, game, you can develop this game and uh, how you see it, if you do it. I don't fully understand the question. Uh, if you take uh, IP to uh, Rick and Morty, how you see this game on PC or console? Well, there is, there's a pretty good mobile game out. Yeah. I, so, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, you look at the genre, I mean, if you, not the genre, if you, you look at the platform for the IP, I mean, if you look at things like Family Guy and The Simpsons, those are, those are big brands that make a lot of sense for mobile free to play. Um, Rick and Morty has, a, not that it's not a great show, um, a much smaller audience. Um, but then again, I would say that th that audience is probably more likely to, to spend money to, to, to buy something. So I think Rick, Rick and Morty makes a ton of sense on, on Steam, on PC. Uh, and premium mobile, um, but yeah, I think we'll make that determination. I mean, we'll, oh, I shouldn't announce anything. Uh, we'll, some of our IP will do exclusively premium. We'll make sure that it's up on Steam and, and or Congregate, um, you know, other, other platforms where people will pay for it, um, as opposed to like a big network television show, which will do free to play mobile, which where it makes the most sense. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.